This morning we're continuing our series in Leviticus. We're going to be looking at Leviticus chapter 17 and 18. Um, and I'm calling this when in Rome because that, that phrase kind of came to mind. You know, that's, uh, that's a pretty popular phrase, that when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Um, and, and people use it to generally like, encourage you in a positive way to engage in the culture that you're uh, traveling among. Try to blend in and, and do what they do and, and kind of fully experience uh, whatever culture or country you're traveling in. But in this pa- it came to mind because this passage actually kind of tells you the flip side of that. And, and through a lot of this, these next several chapters, God will repeatedly tell the Israelites, do not do as they did in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan. In other words, don't do what they did in the place you're coming from or the place you're going to. You need to be unique and holy to me. And, and that, there's good reason for that because this section of Leviticus that we're beginning uh, is what's popularly known as the holiness code. The chapter 17 uh, to the end is often referred to as the holiness code. Um, and uh, it, it kind of goes through a lot of different areas of life and is a, is a lot of different things to talk about what they need to do, how they need to live. Um, and, and one of the ways that many Christians approach this uh, part of the Bible and really like the whole Old Testament as a whole, but often uh, the, the, the you know, first five books, the Torah uh, specifically, is that they will uh, kind of look through it and, and they're kind of read it and kind of go like, okay, let's see now. How can I get out of this? Uh, what, do, what do I have? To, well, how, what, how much of this do, do I not have to do? All right? That's oftentimes how we approach it. We approach it of like, okay, but what's like, how close could I get to the line? Or how can I get around it? Or where are the loopholes? Come on, help me deal. Right? That's oftentimes how we approach Scripture. But that's not a good way to approach Scripture. And it's not a way that really acknowledges who God is, right? If we acknowledge God as our loving Father who sent His only Son to die in our place so that we might find forgiveness and peace with Him, then we would respond in wanting to know how he wants us to live. We would want to know him more and do as much as we could in the way that he wants it to be done. We wouldn't try to see him as as putting these rules on us that we can try to get around. But oftentimes that is how we approach this. Another way that we often approach passages like this is to find, instead of personal application, uh, to find cultural correction. Right? Either for... Um, people that, individual people that you know, or oftentimes for the culture at large. And that's going to be a major temptation in this, uh, in in, in today's passage and and through uh, a lot of these next couple weeks as we look at the holiness code is to look at, to look at it, to be reading it and going, you know, you know, see, I told you, this is why our culture is going off track. This is why the country's going under. People don't do it. Okay. And while I understand that that can be fun, Right, And it's true, it's certainly true that as we read this and you see that way that cultural norms have shifted away from the word of God and away from the way of God, obviously, duh. Like, it's not going to go well when people walk away from God. But that doesn't really do you any good. It doesn't really change you, it doesn't help you, and it doesn't really help you engage the culture and have a love and a heart for the people who are in rebellion and who need to know Jesus and need to find salvation in him. So rather than trying to, uh, you know, find and force people into obeying God's laws, we need to think about how do we share his love with these people and how do we become more and more like Jesus as we seek to grow in our sanctification. We'll look first here at Leviticus chapter 17, one through nine. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel and say to them, this is the thing that Yahweh has commanded. If any one of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it as a gift to Yahweh in front of the tabernacle of Yahweh, blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among his people. 
This is to the end that the people of Israel may bring their sacrifices that they sacrifice in the open field, that they may bring them to Yahweh, to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to Yahweh. And the priest shall throw the blood of the altar on the altar of Yahweh at the entrance of the tent of meeting and burn the fat for a pleasing aroma to Yahweh. So they shall no more sacrifice through their sacrifices to no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. And you shall say to them, any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them who offers a burnt offering or a sacrifice and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it to Yahweh, that man shall be cut off from among his people. So this first prohibition is that every animal, every animal that's killed for food needs to be brought um, and presented before Yahweh as a peace offering. And the, the reason for this is that slaughtering any animal for food without connection to sacrifice to some entity was simply not done at the time. It was actually a common practice to slaughter, ritually slaughter an animal and drain its blood onto your field in order, in worship of some god or, de or demon or whatever it might be, uh, whatever words we want to use, to put the blood in the field so that it would increase the yield of the crop. So there was no real situation. It was because they, they connected, culturally connected, the idea that blood is powerful, that sacrificing these animals is powerful spiritually. They're not going to waste it by just killing the animal for food. It's always going to be connected to some kind of sacrifice. And so that's why God tells them, Any, you, can, you can kill it wherever you want, but it's got to be brought to me. You've got to bring it to me. You're not bringing it to some other God. You're not going to go offer this to some other God. So all animals who were killed had to be presented to Yahweh to help ensure that they would not be presented to some false God. Now, this is kind of an interesting connection to um, uh, the problem that this, that this problem really persisted into the days of the early church. So when Paul was um, uh, dealing, writing to these New Testament Christians in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10, he covers like what should be done about eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols. Because all the way from Moses' day into Paul's day, there were the, the main source of meat was meat that had been sacrificed to some deity. And so when Paul's writing to these early church leaders, they're, they're trying to decide, like, well, how do we deal with this? What can we eat? Can we eat this meat or not? Because you would go to, the, to, to go buy meat. You would literally go to these different altars and buy meat from food, meat, animals that were sacrificed to God A and God B and God C. And you just have to decide... Which one do you want to buy your meat from? But that's, there's no other option. There's not just a normal meat market. It's all in these, in, in, in the, uh, from these altars. And so he's got to, to te tell them, what do we do about this? We'll look at a short section. Like I said, he covers this over like three chapters. But we'll look at verses 4 through 7 of chapter 8. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there are, may be so may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, for, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food that has really been offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So Paul kind of draws this interesting conclusion that he says that there's, there's nothing wrong with eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols, as long as you don't have a personal connection to those idols. You don't have a history, you don't have a past, that when you go and do it, you're not also kind of replaying some of your old worship practices, that you're not connecting with that in that way. And then he adds in there that we also shouldn't cause anyone else to stumble, meaning that like if, if you were with somebody who also used to worship this God that the meat had been sacrificed to, you shouldn't be like, hey, let's go get some meat from this stand, because 
that guy, it might cause him problems. He might, he might start going back into his worship things. And if it's not worship for you, it might be for them. And so you need to be careful with that. Now, now, so you guys understand, now you know what to do about eating meat sacrificed to idols, right? How I many has ever, you ever had that problem? No? Okay. Oh, man. Okay, so then we have to find modern equivalents, right? So that's not something that's an issue for us. That was an active issue for, again, for a long period of time. What do we do about this? For us, we might kind of think about some other things that are maybe similar. I'll give you two examples, but there's all kinds of examples you can find in, uh, in our world today. The first uh, will be yoga. So yoga is essentially, uh, and for many people, just stretching, right? It's using different uh, poses and things like that. It's essentially just stretches that you can do, and there's many people who practice it, and it's just stretching. There are other people who practice it as a religious practice, Right, as a worshipful practice, a way of connecting with, um, you know, Eastern mysticism and all the kinds of things, like in it, connecting with spirits and, and things like that. And it's an active worship practice. Now, there's nothing wrong with stretching, I promise. I looked through the Bible, couldn't find anything. They say you can't stretch, okay? And so if you're using some poses and you're, you're you know, happen to be using poses that are the same as yoga poses and you want to call it yoga, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that unless you have previously worshiped that way. Unless it was previously a part of your life that that's how, or you even currently, when you do it, you're doing it in that way, you should stop because you're connecting with demons, honestly, and you need to stop doing that. But there's nothing wrong with the poses. There's nothing wrong with stretching. I'll give you a second example, um, and, and this is a little bit, um, this is an interesting one. So you'll notice earlier um, when, uh, when, when I talked about our trunk or treat, I said, hey, we always do our trunk or treat on the 31st now. We've just found that more people come. We used to do it the last Saturday in October, but now we always do it on the 31st, and so that's why we're having it on the 31st. And I always just say, October 31st. I always say October 31st. But you all know what it is. Right? I'm intentionally not saying Halloween. But it's Halloween. We're doing it because it's Halloween. That's honestly, we're, it's an outreach to the community. We know that that's when kids are going to come. And, and we want to be able to share the love of Jesus with them. And it's a way that we can co-opt that and get on board that kind of activity is all over Acts, by the way. I promise. <laughs> um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But, and again, so Halloween, similar to the yoga situation. If for you, Halloween means dressing up in a silly costume and taking your kids trick-or-treating door-to-door, getting candy, and then coming home and eating the candy, there's nothing really wrong with candy. Don't Maybe don't have too much, right? Your body's a temple and all that. But there's nothing wrong with dressing up in silly costumes, nothing wrong with eating candy. There is certainly another side of Halloween that is deeply connected to the occult and, and is very dark and disturbing and should not be practiced whatsoever. If any of your Halloween practices are related to that, you should stop. Right, you should stop. And that's the reason we don't say Halloween when we talk about those outreaches and that kind of thing. That's why we'd never... I never pressure anybody if they don't want to be a part of those kind of things because there is certainly a dark side of Halloween that is connected to the occult and is evil, right? And so similarly to this meat sacrifice to idols, there's a differentiation there and some sensitivity that we need to have and, a, and, a, and an individual, personal, Holy Spirit-led conviction that we need to have about these kind of issues. Okay. Okay, um, so another thing he says here is uh, talking about goat demons. So a pervasive cultural problem of, of making sacrifices to false gods, idols, and demons is why um, verse 7 comments that they're no longer making any more sacrifices to goat demons. Now again, this is another situation is we don't have anybody here who's ever sacrificed to a goat demon, right? I don't think so. I've never heard of any of you sacrificing to goat demons, but it's certainly 
But the reason that it's mentioned here specifically is because it, even though it seems strange to us, it was a very real temptation for the Israelites. It was a very real temptation for the Israelites. Um, and, and so we need to consider what are some equivalently tempting practices in our own culture today. So he says here that all peace offerings, all animals need to be offered as peace offerings and that the fat would be burned on the altar. Some of the meat would be given to the priests. The majority would be kept by the offerer. But it would make it so that every meal was connected. Every meal connected you to God. If anyone failed to offer the meat to, to Yahweh, they would be, the blood guilt would be imputed to them. The, the consequence for sacrificing to false gods, demons, or idols would be that they would be cut off. They would be cut off from the people of God, meaning they would be no longer considered an Israelite. They would no longer be able to offer sacrifices at the tabernacle, and they would no longer be able to live within the Israelite camp. And this is because blood was powerful. And the Israelites recognized this. They wouldn't, they knew that it was capable of atoning for sin and the misuse of its power was exactly the reason they might not present an animal to Yahweh. And it's why they might mishandle it in any number of ways, including drinking it, which is what we'll get to next year in 10 through 16. If any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. Anyone also of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them who takes in hunting any beast or bird that may be eaten shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth. For the life of every creature is its blood, its blood is its life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any creature, for the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. And every person who eats it, what dies of itself or what is torn by beasts, whether he is a native or a sojourner, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Then he shall be clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his flesh, he shall bear his iniquity. So the Israelites are prohibited from eating blood entirely. It's not merely a dietary restriction. Again, it's a, uh, it's a regulation against false worship. And so the blood is regularly used in religious r rituals. There was not really that they would have a use for it outside of that. If they were to consume blood, it would be in a ritualistic wor pagan worship practice like those of the Egyptians and the Canaanites. But he, must, he makes it very clear, reiterating this over and over again here, that the life of the flesh is in its blood. Every creature's life is its blood. And so he's essentially telling them they're, they're prohibited from consuming the life of the creature because that belongs to God. It's this essential characteristic of blood that made it effective for atonement. This is also what, what makes Jesus' sacrifice so powerful and what makes what he ends up telling the disciples to do uh, at, at the Last Supper when he is presenting the, uh, the Eucharist, right? He's, when he's presenting the Lord's Supper, he says, take and drink, this is my blood of the new covenant. And they've, they're familiar with this passage. They know what it says. That would be shocking even to hear, even as someone handed you a, a, some wine, to be told, take and drink, this is my blood. But again, it's because the life of the flesh is in the blood the life is what makes atonement possible. He also says that this should apply to any stranger who sojourns among you. So foreigners coming to live among the Israelites was a real possibility. The Israelites were to enforce many of these laws with whoever lived among them. This is a major difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, the Israelites we're told to enforce God's laws as the government of God's people. 
right? They were a nation governed by God's laws, and so they had to enforce his laws among their people. Under the new covenant, Christians are asked to live by God's laws in many countries, regardless of their governance. So there's an interesting question that we might want to examine here, which is, does the prohibition against eating blood apply to us? Does that apply to us today? There's some inter interesting uh, arguments as to why that might be the case. So uh, first off, it's one of the first laws that is given. It's the first law that's given to Noah when he comes off of the ark in Genesis chapter 9, verse 4, where he says, you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. This is the first time seemingly that humans are eating meat at all, and it's given to Moses immediately, or to, to Noah, excuse me, uh, immediately that they should not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. It's also maintained and affirmed by the early church. So when Gentile believers are first coming in to the, uh, to the fold, <clears throat> they are, there's some question about it because the, the, the apostles who were all Israelites, who were all Jews, that uh, had lived with all of these laws and restrictions and at this point cultural norms, they're now saying like, okay, all these Gentile believers are coming and accepting our Messiah. They're coming into the fold. They're being brought into the church. What do they need to do? Like, how Jewish do they need to be? That's really the question that they're asking. Circumcision is one of the, 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 the possibilities on the table. Like, do they need to get circumcised? What, what all needs to happen with them as they're brought in? And here's what they end up, even after they, they have to even believe that it happened. And so there's some testimony from uh, Paul and Barnabas and, and even Peter. Um, and then here's what they conclude in, in Acts 15, 19 through 20. It says, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, to, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. So, he tells them four things. There's four things that these are the, again, imagine this is like, hey, there's some new believers. There's a new church happening here. What should we tell them that they need to do? These are the four things that they're like, we need to make sure they know. Okay? He tells them not to, not to eat meat sacrificed to idols, to abstain from sexual morality, to not eat animals who have been strangled, and to not eat blood. Now, those last two are related because the, the, the not eating animals that have been strangled or that have died fully intact is that their blood has not been properly drained. That's the reason for that prohibition being in there. So those two are really tied together, the blood and the, the animals that have been strangled. So really, you might even say three things. But we can think about a couple things here. First, we already just looked at this prohibition against eating meat sacrificed to idols that by the time Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, he's telling them, hey, this doesn't, this isn't universally banned. Some believers it's acceptable for. So right off the bat, we have one that we know does not always apply to everybody. The second one, sexual morality, we can pretty clearly see that that is sinful and wrong and there's no really gray area there. So you have two of these items. You have the, the, meat that is sacrificed to idols, that's sometimes okay for some believers, and you have sexual morality, never okay for any believers, and then you have blood. Which camp does the blood belong in? Is it one of those that is sometimes okay for some believers, or is it one that never, no, believers should never uh, consume? It does seem to be separate from the other dietary restrictions because it pre-existed those, and it's also one that is at any point in the New Testament affirmed that they should continue in it, continue not to, to consume blood because all the other ones are taken away, right? By the time, this is after Peter uh, has the revelation about eating all the animals, right? When he says, like, hey, you can eat, kill, and eat. And Peter says, never, Lord. And he says, don't call what I've said is clean, unclean. This is after that happens, that they have this and they write this about not eating blood. So it does seem to be separate from those things. So is it something that Christians can, can, 
can believing Christians, can they eat blood or not? I don't know. I think it's something that we have to, you have to listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You read these passages, study these passages, and, and pray about it, and, 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 and listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's certainly not something that we need to divide over, um, but it's something we should certainly consider before you order your next steak. Okay. All right. We'll look lastly here at Leviticus 18. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am Yahweh your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan in which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall not follow my rule. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am Yahweh your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am Yahweh. None of you shall approach any of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am Yahweh. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, for their nakedness is your own nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter brought up in your fa father's family since she is your sister. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister for she is your father's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister for she is your mother's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. That is, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law, for she is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter. You shall not take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. They are relatives. It is depravity. You shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanness. You shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife, and so make yourself unclean with her. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech, and so profane the name of God, I am Yahweh. You shall not lie with a male as with a, as with a woman. It is an abomination. You shall not lie with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to any animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, and for by them all these nations, and I am driving out before you, have become unclean. And the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules, and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations, so that the land became unclean, lest the land vomit you out, when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the person who, persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abomination, abominable customs that were practiced before you, and never make yourselves unclean by them. I am Yahweh, your God. The primary reason this passage is so extensive is because the sexual immorality in Egypt and Canaan was very great. It's kind of an example of, you know, you see, um, you see like uh, warning signs or like rule signs, and, and you're like, why would they put that there? Why, why do they feel like they need to say, um, you know, no driving on the sidewalk? Because somebody did it, you know? That's what this passage is passages essentially because he could have just said hey that, that you can only only have sex with your wife right husbands and wives male and female you guys if you're married you can have sex nobody else but he doesn't he has to list this all out because these are things that people actually did this again was tied to worship in the period sexual acts were regularly performed in temples to excite the gods to send rain. So this is something that was tied to this thing. I also forgot to mention that. I think it's clear from, from the context as you read it, but when he talks about uncovering nakedness, he's essentially talking about sexual intercourse. 
there's also a promise here early on in verse 5 where he says, if you keep my statutes and my rules, if a person does them, he shall live by them. And I just want you to notice there that he's not saying that like, oh, they live by them the way we say, oh, these are the rules I live by. He's saying if he does them, he will live by them, meaning that he will thrive because of them. He will find abundant life in these things. So if we break down this passage a little bit, in verses 6 through 18, he talks about uh, not committing incest, right? There are 13 verses here dealing with, ex uh, which detail exactly which relatives you should not have sexual intercourse with. The list includes parents, step-parents, siblings, step-siblings, grandchildren, aunts and uncles, siblings-in-law, children-in-law, and stepchildren. There's also a regulation in there that if you practice polygamy, not to marry two sisters. Now, polygamy was practiced during this period. It was practiced by the, the forefathers and for many generations in Israel. Polygamy seems to have been permissible during the Old Testament period, even though it was not part of God's original design. In the New Testament, the apostles affirm that monogamy is God's attention to mar intention for marriage, as we see in 1 Timothy and Titus. He also prohibits sex during menstruation, which is a prohibition related to the prohibition against blood, that uh, sex, you, sex during menstruation was used as a form of pagan worship because of the recognized power of blood. He also reiterates um, adultery being forbidden here in verse 20, even though it's already banned in the Ten Commandments. And in verse 22, he bans homosexual intercourse. Now, I do want to leave a little bit of a note here, because I know that this is certainly a, a verse that has been brought up. Like, this is the only time you've heard of Levitic Leviticus before, is people quoting this passage against homosexuality. Um, and, and it's clear. It's very clear that, that um, homosexual practice, homosexual intercourse, is sinful. But I do want to leave one note there in terms of, again, talking, thinking about how do we engage in our culture and how do we take the gospel to our culture and just consider how the gospel is meant to work. Because oftentimes our approach toward, toward, toward these issues, which I mean, it has, we've expanded the, the amount of this list that is applicable in our culture recently. Right, where the, this is, these things have become more common, sexual perversions become more common um, in, in our culture. As we consider how do we interact with, our, with the, the culture in that way, I want us to consider something about this. And that is that the gospel isn't that we change ourselves, that we change our behavior in order to be worthy to come to Christ. We are regenerated after we have come to him, right? We come to him in whatever state we're in. We accept the forgiveness that he has offered us. We choose to make him our Lord. He indwells us by the Holy Spirit. And then he slowly starts changing us to become more and more like Jesus. And that process involves being convicted of our sin, right? Per continually, perpetually, as we grow in Christ, we come to find out more and more things are sinful about us. So when we consider preaching the gospel to people who, who practice homosexuality or people who struggle with homosexuality, we consider that that is a, a difficult temptation to struggle with. We might consider what it's like to struggle with heterosexual temptation, right? That that is difficult, but we offer you an outlet, right? We say like, hey, you can try to get married. Now, it might be difficult to get married, but it's possible, to get married and, and have an outlet for those desires. If you struggle with homosexual temptation, our only real recourse is abstinence, right? That you have to abstain from that behavior, which is a difficult thing for someone to deal with. And we always have to remember that no matter what, which of these practices someone might be engaged in, they need Jesus first before they're going to change. It's the Holy Spirit's conviction that will cause them to change. And no one is in a state where they cannot accept Jesus before they change their behavior. It doesn't work that way. It's something that changes after. Our sanctification happens after 
our salvation. In verse 23, 23 here, we see that bestiality is also prohibited in this passage. And again, there were bestial practices in the pagan worship practices of Egypt and Canaan. In verse 21, we see child sacrifice banned, specifically sacrifice to Molech, which is a, a demon god. And this practice involved burning infants alive. And, and it was common in the period. These kind of things I bring, and I know that's brutal to hear, but like uh, later on, it, as you read through, um, through the Old Testament, specifically the first five books, and you get into like Deuteronomy, you, you find God telling the Israelites, like, wipe them out entirely, right? Do not leave anyone alive. Wipe them out entirely. And recognizing that these were regular worship practices, that regular worship practices of the Canaanites included burning infants alive, um, raping temple prostitutes, committing all of these acts, it helps you understand why God would say that. That he is not just saying, oh, these are some people who are bowing down to the wrong thing. No, they are doing terrible evil. That's why he says in verses 24 through 28 that these are the practices that are the reason God's driving these people out of Canaan. He's going to drive them out and he's warning the Israelites, do not pick up these practices because then you will be driven out as well. If anyone practices these abominations, they'll be cut off from among their people. They'd have to leave the camp, find other people to live among. They would not be able to worship in the tabernacle. Now, there is a New Testament parallel to the policy of being cut off if one practiced the abominations uh, found in, in Matthew 18. So in Matthew 18, when we think about, um, about what, the, what does this look like in our day, what does it mean to be cut off in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, it says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector." What he's saying here is that if a brother or sister in Christ refuses to be repentant after multiple confrontations, they need to be treated like someone who doesn't know the gospel. Continuing to allow them to pretend that they're part of the body of Christ is not helpful to them, and it's damaging to our witness. I want to wrap up here by talking about motivation. We talked about a little bit already. But as we consider the fact that God is asking the Israelites to live in these ways, to obey these laws, to do the things that he's asked them to do. I want you to consider the order that these things came in, right? God brought them out of the land of Egypt, and he chose to dwell among them in their camp, to live among them in their camp. And, and he has told them that he's going to take them to the promised land, make them a nation. They did not ask for any of those things. Right? They, and they didn't earn any of those things. They didn't, they didn't like do enough that God decided, okay, I guess they've tried hard enough. Now I'll come. No, he just did it with them. This is something he was just going to do. And now he's asking them to respond to that in this way, to respond to that grace that they've been given by living in these ways. It's really the same as is for us, right? That Jesus died for us, that he rose again on our behalf, that he forgives us of our sin, makes peace with God possible, and dwells us with his Holy Spirit, and then asks us to live in response to that love. None of it is ever about earning God's favor. It's about living in response to the love and grace and kindness that he has already shown to us. And it's really important that we don't get those things flipped. We'll wrap up with this, how should we then live? Three takeaways. Number one, do not allow cultural norms to dictate morality. It can be easy. It can be tempting to just like that's, I mean, that's why he has to be so specific as they're about to enter this land and be around all these other cultural norms to allow cultural norms to tell us what is right and wrong, but ultimately the word of God needs to tell us what is right and wrong. Number two, consider 
whether your behaviors are glorifying to God. That in everything you do, in what you eat, in where you go, everything is it glorifying to God. And then third, live like people who have been redeemed in response to what Jesus has done for us. I'm going to pray here in just a second, and then um, we'll take communion together. We'll sing one closing song, and we'll have a prayer team that will be available right over here if you'd like prayer for anything. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this word, that your, your word is good and true and wise and helpful. God, I pray that it would um, work in us, that your Holy Spirit would convict us, that it would cause us to grow in Christ-likeness day by day. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.